Welcome to Europe Debates. I'm Richard Milsom, the director of the European Conservative and Reformist Party in Brussels, and thank you for joining me for our weekly and popular series of webinars. Last week marked the 75th, uh, 75 years since the end of the Second World War in Europe. Since then, Europe has enjoyed an unprecedentedly long period of peace and prosperity. Much of this success is owed to NATO and the Transatlantic Alliance. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization has been the pillar of European security and both survived the Cold War and the War on Terror. Last year, the Alliance celebrated its 70th birthday and this year admitted its 30th member. Despite all of its victories and successes, the future of NATO continues to be unclear. The ECR party has long been at the forefront of defending NATO and the Transatlantic Alliance. So we welcome you all here today as we discuss the future of the Alliance. Now this webinar is live streamed across multiple platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and on our website. And we're very grateful for the many people that have registered and will be following this debate live. Please do use the comments in the sec comment sections to ask questions, which I will relay to the panel. So let's get it started. And I'd like to invite our panel to each give a five minute introductory remark, uh, starting with our first panelist, uh, Niall Gardner. Now, Niall is the director of the Heritage Foundation's Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. Um, he is a leading authority on transatlantic relations and has, has advised the executive branch of the US government on a range of key issues, from the role of international allies in post-war Iraq to the US-British leadership in the war on terrorism. Prior, prior to joining Heritage in 2002, Niall was the foreign policy researcher for, for um, the former British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. He received his doctorate from Yale University and also has a master's from Oxford University in history. He has a broad range of international experience and appears frequently as a policy analyst and political commentator on national and international television. He joins us from Washington, DC. So Niall, good morning to you. Uh, and I wonder if you could uh, kick us off with a very broad sort of question as what do you see as the main priority for NATO? Well, firstly, thank, thanks very much uh, for uh, hosting us all um, uh, today and uh, delighted to join you from uh, Washington, D.C., also under lockdown uh, here. Uh, and uh, just um, just like to say a few words really about the, the big picture on the uh, on the present state of the NATO alliance and, and the future of the, the NATO alliance uh, as well, and also the, uh, the key priorities facing the alliance. Um, I'm actually uh, optimistic really about the present state of NATO and also about the uh, the future of of, uh, of NATO. Um, I think NATO today is actually in a significantly stronger position uh, than it was uh, four or five uh, years ago. Uh, you now have uh, more US uh, troops on the ground in Europe than there were several years ago. Uh, you now have increased defense spending by almost all NATO uh, members. Uh, you you now have uh, you know the establishment of a, of a permanent U.S. military base in uh, in Poland, standing up to the Russian uh, threat, uh, and I think that the the alliance has been given a new lease of life actually uh, over the course of the last three and a half years, and and this really runs counter to the, uh, the the sort of narrative that you often see in in Europe, which suggests that uh, President Trump is uh, disinterested in the NATO alliance or that he is disengaging the United States from US leadership in the world. I think quite the opposite is in fact uh, the case. There's very strong US leadership that is, uh, that is in place at this time. Uh, the United States is 100% committed to the NATO alliance. And I think it was very significant that uh, President Trump uh, really championed uh, NATO at the NATO leaders uh, meeting in, uh, in London last, last December in the face of a great deal of negativity, I thought, from uh, from Emmanuel uh, Macron. Uh, and it is significant uh, today that uh, the United States really, uh, I, I think, is at the, the forefront of ensuring uh, that NATO remains uh, relevant, uh, that NATO members are equipped to uh, meet their obligations. Uh, and there is a, a real contrast, I think, between the approach taken by, by the US president today and that of uh, say the French president, who is calling for the creation of a of a European Union uh, army, and in my view, it would be a huge strategic error for Europe to go down uh, the path of uh, of building a European Union army. This would this would certainly uh, 
act as a competitor to NATO. It would take uh, precious resources away from the NATO alliance and it would undermine NATO. And with good reason, I think the Russians would welcome the, the creation of a European Union army. And so we're very concerned here in Washington about um, the drive by some European uh, politicians uh, to move forward with creating uh, some kind of European Union army that, that frankly would split the alliance right down, uh, down the middle uh, and would take, I think, scarce resources away from, uh, from NATO. The last thing we need is a divided NATO alliance uh, that suits the interests of uh, the Russian bear on our eastern uh, flank. And we must not do anything, in, in, in my view, to undermine uh, the, the sanctity of the NATO alliance, to undermine, undermine the unity of the NATO alliance. Uh, and it's very clear to me that the, uh, the suggestions coming from Emmanuel Macron and other Euro-Federalists that uh, there should be a drive towards an EU defence identity, this is highly destructive. Uh, and I think it will significantly erode uh, the strength of the NATO alliance. So we have to remain united in the face of the Russian threat. And I think the key, the top priority for NATO must be uh, collective defense, standing up to Russian aggression uh, in Europe. That must be at the heart of NATO's core mission. We must also, of course, be aware of the rising threat posed by, by China, also by Iran. But our central mission must be uh, to prevent uh, NATO uh, being uh, NATO members being threatened by uh, by Moscow, uh, and it is vital that in the the coming years that all NATO uh, members step up to the plate, commit to spending at least two percent of GDP on defence. This, of course, includes the Germans and the French. The Germans, in particular, who currently spend about one point three five percent of GDP on defence, it's unacceptable. We need to see every single NATO members stepping up to the plate, making a full commitment to the future of NATO. And NATO, in, in my view, is the very heart of the transatlantic alliance. Uh, NATO cannot be replaced by anything else. And uh, whoever is the US president in 2021 must ensure that NATO is further strengthened uh, and that NATO remains the very, the very heart of the transatlantic alliance. We also must see uh, a US foreign policy that is focused upon strengthening the transatlantic alliance and ensuring that US leadership continues to be strong and is maintained at the very highest levels. Uh, I would also add before I conclude as well that uh, in my view, uh, I believe that, uh, that Brexit is, uh, is something that will further strengthen both NATO and the transatlantic alliance. There is no stronger adversary within Europe for the Russians than Brexit Britain. Uh, and, and I believe that, uh, that Brexit will be great for, for the UK, great for Europe and great for the, uh, for the broader transatlantic alliance, especially the NATO alliance. So uh, I'm a firm believer in the, uh, the, the power of Brexit to strengthen NATO rather than weaken or undermine uh, NATO. So, so just a few op opening thoughts there. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you today. Well, no, thank you very much for that. There's some very interesting points that we can develop a little bit further within that. Um, perhaps now if I turn to um, a gen a Lieutenant General Manuel Mestre Barea of the Spanish Air Force, um, who is currently serving as a member of parliament for the Vox Party in Spain. Um, the party leader, leader, Santiago Abascal, chose General Barea as number one on his list for the recent Spanish parliamentary elections in Alicante last, last year. Um, and throughout his distinguished career, he's held different senior positions within the Spanish Air Force and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, with operational tours under his belt in Afghanistan, Kuwait, uh, and Bosnia, uh, and has been the commander of the Canary Islands Air Command and the Chief of Staff of the NATO Joint Force in Lisbon. Uh, actually, in Lisbon, he was in charge of Operation Ocean Shield, uh, the fight against piracy and on the Horn of Africa, and in close coordination with uh, Operation EU Atlanta, and support from the NATO uh, to the African Union. Uh, it's a great honour to have the General with us today, joining us from Alicante. Uh, and perhaps I could hand the floor across to you, uh, and you could uh, talk about what you see as your main uh, uh, priorities for NATO, uh, and perhaps a little bit about um, how we, uh, we risk NATO being undermined by the current EU plans. <laughs> 
General. Do you want to unmute? Okay, uh, my pronoun. Okay. Let me start, Richard, with uh, telling that it's for me an honor to share this uh, virtual floor with so prominent participants with uh, extensive experience in government, business, academia, and public uh, uh, policy. I only had 40 years in the military and, and a half one and a half year in the Spanish parliament. NATO, I have lived in NATO for three and a half years, like you said, like chief of staff in Joint for Command Lisbon. Beautiful times, I must say. He, from my experience, I must say that NATO is the most successful alliance in history. And that is because all, uh, NATO has been able to bring together North America and Europe after two devastating wars. So we came together and decided this might never happen again. And then for more than 70 years, NATO has been keen in providing peace, preserving peace, and making sure that NATO ally, no one has suffered a military attack. Today, more than seven years later, the threats facing the alliance have changed considerably. I think everybody must agree on that. An attack in North America or Europe by a regular army is highly unlikely. Instead, the alliance must confront an array of more diffuse challenges, ranking from terrorists nuclear proliferation, piracy, cyber attack, the disruption on energy supplies, 5G is going to be a big challenge also, etc. The question is how NATO, having successfully keep the peace in Europe in the 20th century, can adapt to this challenge of the 25th, of the 21st. We must say, that NATO retain values. NATO is an organization of values, and this is very important. We believe in democracy, we believe in human rights, we believe in rule of law, and we believe in the individual freedom. And this made us very strong. NATO, from now on, must expand its vision of collective, of collective defense in order to remain relevant and effective. This means recognize the full range of threats that confront NATO members today and affirming that the Alliance will respond collectively to an act that put in danger the political or economic security or territorial integrity of a member state. That is important. Imagine for a moment a war without NATO. What border might be challenging? And what ethnic conflict might erupt in Europe of, if, if NATO don't exist? And how diminished will, will be United States power and influence be globally without the supporting power of, of their allies in Europe. World adversaries rising to fill the space with their own brand of the rule-based order. For the past 70 years, NATO was an answer to this question. To remain the answer for the next 70 years, it must remain fit for purpose. Thank you. General, thank you very much for those, uh, for those introductory remarks. Uh, let me now turn to uh, Gudlaw Thor Thoradsson, or Guli for short, um, who is an Icelandic politician and the current Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Development Cooperation in Iceland since 2017. Uh, I, Guli is a great friend of, uh, of the ECR party, having served as one of its founding vice presidents. He's been a member of the Icelandic parliament, the Alting, 
uh, for Reykjavik North since 2003. He's also previously been the Minister of Health and Social Security. Um, he joins us from Reykjavik, where I believe you can still get a drink in a bar and visit your relatives. Uh, but Guli, thank you very much for being with us today, uh, and I shall hand the floor to you. Well, thank you, uh, Richard, and it's a pleasure to be with you always, and I hope that we will be able to meet you in person as uh, soon as possible. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it's extremely relevant to speak about NATO. And the first thing that comes in mind, springs in mind when I think about NATO, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And uh, what has NATO done? It's probably been the most successful interest organization in history. And it, it protects our freedom, uh, our citizens, and the security of, te of our te territory. And uh, that shouldn't be taken for granted. We, we know that history has taught us that. And of course, this uh, NATO is uh, the foundation who is the one who uh, protects the core values which it base our societies on. And uh, then I'm talking about something that we take for granted, but should be taken for granted, is democracy individual liberty, human rights, and the rule of law. And I think it's extremely uh, important that we bear this in mind, and uh, because sometimes I, I hear in my job this idea about the European Union Army. To be absolutely honest, uh, no one ha has uh, been able to explain what exactly that is. But to put things into some perspective, when the uh, UK uh, leaves, uh, oh, well, it has left the European Union, then only 20% of uh, the military capabilities of NATO is inside the European Union. So, uh, and we need to do, do more. I would maybe like to, uh, but um, there is no supplement for, for NATO. And uh, I cannot see any reason, and actually it would be uh, irresponsible to try to uh, make some organization or, or some unit uh, next in line or, or somehow uh, supposed to supplement NATO. But what I want to draw your attention to, because I'm not going to repeat uh, the excellent word that was spoken before me, is that uh, when you talk about the new challenges, and that's something we feel very much in Iceland, is that we are seeing a, a lot of different changes in the Arctic. And what does it mean? So we all know about the challenges when it comes to climate change and, and all those things. It means that the Arctic will open up at one point. It means that we can say the whole year through the Arctic. And uh, it simply means that uh, the, the shortening distance between uh, Europe and Asia will be short by 40%. This is similar to, uh, similar to uh, when the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal, Canal was opened up. And that's probably the reason, uh, uh, not probably, that's the reason that players that have not been uh, maybe so... Uh, much interested in uh, this area are very interested now. And the challenges we are facing is definitely, uh, as has been mentioned, we are, we are facing challenges with new technology, 5G has been mentioned and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and we are rather familiar with uh, the threat of Russia. We shouldn't be complacent, but we, we know what to more or less to deal with. What we haven't seen before uh, I think we could say, at least in modern history, that we are seeing uh, the challenges uh, when it comes to that we have an authoritarian state, which is also an economic superpower. And I think that we see now during this COVID pandemic that we are showing a lot of vulnerabilities with, uh, with the Western nations, which we need to deal with. Uh, but uh, in short, uh, there's always been need for NATO. There's always been need for a transatlantic uh, uh, organization, which is, uh, uh, and uh, we will, but, uh, and uh, that's something that everyone uh, should be aware of. But what I'm saying is that uh, the strength of NATO has been, has been always been ready to adapt, and we need to uh, be very much aware of these new, new challenges. I just mentioned one when it comes to the Arctic. But, uh, but uh, we could, make, we could, of course, uh, mention a lot more. But uh, this is the time for the transatlantic uh, uh, nations, and then I talk about especially North America and Europe, and uh, the Western nation in, in whole, 
to be very much aware, be very much aware when it comes to national security and security and, and defense. And uh, the only, uh, and the most, without any doubt, uh, the tool that is most effective as served as best is NATO, and that is not going to change in the near future. So we should be very focused on, on NATO. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guli, there. Um, so now moving to our final distinguished panellist, uh, James Wharton. James was a member of parliament for the constituency of Stockton South from 2010 to 2017. Under David Cameron, James was the Minister for Local Growth and the Northern Powerhouse in the, de the development of communities and local government. In 2016, Theresa May moved James up to be Minister for Africa at the Department of International Development, where he oversaw the government's £5 billion uh, aid programme in Africa. He's a qualified solicitor. James retains a keen interest in politics and Parliament and has been a regular and strong supporter of the ECR party. Um, he has a unique insight into the key aspects of Brexit and the legislative process, as well as an in-depth understanding of the Parliamentary Conservative Party and how government determines policy. Um, perhaps, James, you could give us your introductory remarks um, and obviously uh, talk a little bit about how Brexit is going to change any future relation. Apologies, I think I was on, uh, on mute there. Uh, I think if I may, uh, Richard, I might be a little pessimistic, if nothing else, just to challenge some of the optimism of other speakers with which I, I do fundamentally agree. NATO has served uh, the Western Allies very well for over 70 years. Uh, it has been an incredible force for good in the world and has secured peace uh, often in the most challenging circumstances and faced with uh, real and, and very serious threats. Uh, to what would have been a number of, of member states. Uh, but I don't know what its future holds. I think there are a number of big issues that it is not sufficiently robustly addressing at this time. And the first that I would touch on is the, the change of the nature of the threats that we face. Mm -hmm. So it may be that it is less likely that tens of thousands of Soviet tanks are going to roll over the border uh, and, and make a charge towards mm -hmm. Western Europe. Uh, however, other threats, which can be very significantly damaging to our economies and way of life, are nonetheless growing and becoming uh, ever more commonplace and ever more prevalent. An example would be cyber warfare, where so much now of the strength of the military is measured not by the numbers and fitness of its soldiers, but by the intelligence and quality of its computers and the things that very clever people can do with them, far behind what would have been the traditional front line in any conflict. I think that although there have been moves to address this, there is a danger that you always fight the last war, as it were, that you always plan um, based on your experience. And because we don't have modern experience of real full-scale cyber warfare, we have incidents of hacking, we have incidents of state and non-state actors doing things that they should not, but we haven't seen a full-scale attack of a military conflict kind in the new space and the new world. Um, and I do therefore question whether the structures of NATO, which were fundamentally established 70 years ago, are sufficiently flexible to adapt to what is now needed today to face the threats that could do so much damage to our economy and our ability to function in the traditional military sense. If communications are brought down, if guidance systems are, are disabled, if tracking systems no longer work. Uh, I think there are new methods of warfare that NATO is still learning to adapt to uh, and, and has some way to go to be truly ready for. The other significant threat I think that NATO faces as an organization, and despite all of the, the positive rhetoric we hear, and it is true that having had a skeptical start in his rhetoric, Donald Trump even seems to have moved more positively towards supporting NATO and the US's role in it. I think it's welcome that so many states are recognizing the need to meet their 2% spending commitment, although there is still some way to go on that and there are still there is still a legitimate debate about the level of burden the United States carries. NATO is overwhelmingly dependent on the United States. Whatever any individual country or even the European Union were it to develop further to integrate its defense and security policy, whatever they might want to think, the real force behind NATO is the military of the United States, which dwarfs any other military 
in the world, uh, with perhaps one potential future exception that we can see on the horizon today, and that is China. China is investing extremely heavily in its military, and it's investing particularly in its navy uh, and the forces that will allow, would allow it, in theory, to project influence, not just in the South China Sea, but further uh, afield. We see that they are increasingly robust in their defense of what they argue are their legal rights over various disputed islands. And we see a construction program for the Chinese Navy at a scale that no kind of other country in the world can currently match. The new Chinese Type 52 destroyers are broadly equivalent at 7,500 tons to uh, US uh, Arleigh Burke class destroyers for anti-air warfare. The new Type 55s are bigger still. The new generation of aircraft carrier, which China is developing, they have two, we expect more to appear, um, are rumored to have the latest types of technology. For example, the electromagnetic launch system, which is only being used on the most very modern of the US carriers. Now, I don't pretend that China today is a match for the United States Navy or the United States military. But I think we should recognize that it is increasingly uh, expanding its military capacity and doubly so given the circumstances of current political debate around China's place in the world and how they handled the initial outbreak of coronavirus. Um, doubly again, given the skepticism that President Trump has uh, clearly expressed throughout his time in office toward China, I would expect to see the United States focus to some degree shifting towards that region, towards those threats and those challenges to its global dominance. If that happens in a world of uh, quite restricted funding, of likely economic challenges, uh, it is difficult to see that the United States would be able to simply scale up uh, in the Pacific without reducing its commitment in the Atlantic. It is difficult to see that the United States can pivot to genuinely continue to challenge China if China continues to grow and continues to be seen as a challenger or, or potential threat without reducing its commitment uh, in Europe. Uh, we don't see, despite some small increases in defense spending, the realistic prospect of Europe being able to match what it could lose with the United States to draw down its commitment and support. Uh, we do see things like the move towards a common defense and security policy, which actually could pose as much a threat to NATO um, as any benefits it could bring in increasing European military independence or capability to contribute towards NATO. And so I think that for all the warm words and all of the breadth of commitment we hear from politicians, generally with some exceptions, of course, uh, towards NATO, the alliance and its importance, the real threat is real politic. We are going to see the United States pulled away from the Atlantic, from Western Europe, because of the growing nature of the challenges to its authority in the, in the Far East. Uh, we are going to see uh, increasingly uh, the importance of different forms of non-traditional asymmetric, often warfare, growing and growing with a real challenge of how we adapt to that. History has shown established military forces very often are the slowest to adapt to changing circumstances and new technologies. And so for all of the positive rhetoric that we might hear and the welcome commitments that are made, I think there is a real risk. And I think given the importance of NATO as the true guarantor of European security now for over 70 years, uh, that it has contributed perhaps more to the world uh, as an alliance than any other before it, and then perhaps any other uh, that will do in the future. We have seen it in recent years, whether it's in leadership in Syria showing weakness, whether it's in adapting to China, uh, showing a shift of focus for the United States, its main member, or it's in the European sphere being challenged by individuals and politicians, it's under threat. And those of us who believe in it are gonna to have to fight hard to retain it and maintain it, I think. Thank, thank you, James. I mean, it's a, it's a very important point with the role of the US in this. So but perhaps I could turn <clears throat> back to Niall. <clears throat> the world is a safer place where we have strong American um, foreign and defense policy. And whatever changes are going to take place, they will be led by the US. So perhaps I could put the question to you now. How, how do you think the US should adapt to face these competing threats from Russia and Islamist terrorists uh, and China and Iran and threats uh, that we will see coming back in the future? 
Uh, that's that's an excellent uh, question there, and a key uh, key question. And uh, and James made uh, some, I think, uh, ex excellent remarks about the the rising uh, challenge posed by uh, by China. Uh, I think the answer is that you know the United States is going to have to confront both the uh, the Chinese threat and the the Russian threat uh, simultaneously. It would be a huge mistake for uh, the United States to withdraw from. Uh, its transatlantic commitments in any way. Uh, there will be those, uh, certainly in, in Washington, who, who will argue that the United States should be primarily a, a Pacific power rather than a European power. There are uh, growing choruses of isolationists here in, in Washington who believe the United States should retreat altogether from the world and just simply focus upon defending its own shores. Uh, but I, I think, though, that the US will continue to maintain its global leadership uh, role, uh, further strengthening its military uh, position uh, in, uh, in Europe, as it has done so over the last few years, while at the same time enhancing its uh, military presence in the Pacific, but also focusing as well on continuing uh, military operations in the Middle East as well. And, and I do think that Iran poses a, uh, a significant threat uh, to uh, international security in addition to China. And so uh, you have on several fronts, I mean, multiple threats of the free world, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, Islamist uh, terrorism, and the United States has to be prepared to meet all those challenges on all fronts. That can only be done by maintaining its present high levels of defense spending and further increasing those levels of defense spending. But at the same time, all America's allies must uh, bear some of that burden as well. We have to see an increase in defense spending levels across uh, the NATO alliance. I think presently only about nine uh, NATO members meet the 2% of GDP expected minimum spend. That's unacceptable. Uh, we have to see greater levels of burden sharing across NATO. Uh, but I'm in no doubt that the United States Will, will continue its, uh, its global leadership role, because if the US does not, the world will be a far more dangerous place. Uh, and uh, I think it's important uh, as well that European leaders focus upon maintaining and strengthening the transatlantic alliance rather than in any way undercutting it or, or dividing it. And so we have isolationists on both sides of the Atlantic uh, who, um, you know, who are, are calling for, for less US uh, international intervention, that, that's a very dangerous uh, message. The United States has to lead on the world stage and has to lead together uh, with its key uh, NATO allies as well, especially uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Poland, uh, Germany as well, has to really step up to the plate, I think, in terms of uh, an increased uh, role within the NATO alliance, standing up to to, uh, to Russia in particular. Uh, so we're all in this together. But uh, I, I do believe that U.S. leadership will remain firmly in place uh, in the coming in the coming years, and the United States will face uh, all of its uh, adversaries if if needed across uh, across across the globe, from Russia to to China. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Perhaps Gouli, I mean, uh, as a serving foreign minister, you're sitting around the table with. Uh, uh, with uh, on the council and on the uh, where the big decisions are, are taken, you mentioned that eighty percent of NATO funding comes now from outside EU countries. Now that the UK has left. I mean, there's a very clear case that the other members should pay, but why don't they? And how can they be persuaded to to fulfil their commitment? Well, it's a good question. Of course, uh, some are uh, just in a position that. Uh, they are very close to the US, so they look at it as a very, uh, so they, they feel very safe, so it's hard to persuade the public to uh, put more into, into military uh, spending. Uh, some say that we are putting so much on develop, developing programs, it's more or less uh, somehow makes up for it, and uh, use historical reasons that they are very, very difficult for them to be uh, big military powers. Uh, but uh, I think that, uh, of course, we just have to uh, talk about this as it is. It's, you have to persuade the public. Uh, 
to uh, for the, uh, the they have to understand the importance. And to be fair, I mean uh, it has increased a lot uh, since 2014. I mean the increase has been enormous when it comes to defense uh, capabilities and uh, defense spending. But uh, if I might, I would like to uh, comment a little bit on what James said that. Uh, I do not see it uh, as optimistic when we talk about the importance of, of, uh, of NATO. It's, and uh, I think that everyone is aware of the challenges. And when we're talking about, because one other thing, that we of course know the challenges which is just direct military threat. But when it comes to uh, cyber warfare, uh, that is something maybe is not that expensive for uh, the ones who want to harm us, but it's something that is extremely important. But and uh, I think that we should be aware of uh, this idea that we shouldn't try to fight the last war. Uh, but fortunately, we are seeing, for example, in Tallinn, that we are seeing a cyber security uh, uh, office or, or organization run by NATO, and uh, we all see the same in Riga. And uh, so, but uh, more needs to be done. But I think that uh, it's all about to, about the will of uh, the politicians, the, uh, that the understanding of the politicians of, uh, of defense uh, spending. But uh, even though we do not have a military in Iceland, we have, uh, we have never uh, put as much money and effort in, in, in NATO. And it's not been hard to explain to the, the public, it's not debated. And I am hoping even though it's not for good reasons, but I'm hoping that uh, the situation as it is should make an understanding for more contribution, more cooperation in NATO. But maybe I'm just too optimistic. So, General, yeah, I'm, feel free to comment on that. But I, I wanted to ask the General, um, you know, you are serving politician in a rapidly growing party, Vox Party in Spain, um, and, you know, you understand these issues. Um, you know, and you've also worked within, you know, European Union and, uh, and, and the defence structures. You know, how do, we, how do we make sure that the EU just doesn't simply try to replicate NATO's capabilities? You know, and do we risk, does NATO risk being undermined by what the EU is currently doing? I, I, am, I am not going to say that the, the European Union feudal army or whatever you want to call is going to be a um, competition for NATO. I don't see this competition in any way. I think that uh, we must work together. We must operate together in a complementary way. And we have seen this way of operate in Kosovo with European Union focusing more in civilian reconstruction and NATO work focusing more in, in operation. And we have seen this in the fight against piracy in, 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 in Somalia with an operation from European Union that complete another operation from NATO. I don't see here a big problem. And the politician must be um, responsible just to get together these two strong power, European Union and NATO, just to work together. I see complementarity. I don't see competition on this. If, if, if I may, uh, if I may uh, uh, make some comment about the 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 one problem that I think is is capable to make growing tension in NATO is is the burden sharing problem um, in relation. I mean, uh, the U.S. Uh, has continually been the nation that bear the greatest burden in this regard. This imbalance has long been an issue and a dispute, which was simply addressed at NATO summit in Wales in 1914, with all members 
pledged to move toward spending 2% of the GPD on defense. However, there are indications that you suggest that this target has not been realized in many countries. And President Trump has been particular, particularly outspoken over the issue, going as far as to label NATO as obsolete in a speech last year. NATO, on the other hand, NATO Secretary General said in November that the majority of allies have plans in place on how to meet that 2% guideline by 2024. In relation with uh, Spain, I must say that we must take on the agreed financial commitment as part of the necessary setting of responsibilities and efforts among allies. That's very, very well said, yes. Yeah. Now, if, if I could pass back to James. Um, do you think, James, that there is scope for NATO to expand into the, um, into the area of border security after the failure of the EU migration crisis? Uh, it's a very good question. If I might, uh, Richard, before I get there, I, I failed to address your initial steer towards Brexit. And I'd like to just make a couple of comments on the things that have come up since. On Brexit, I think that it has a very good opportunity to strengthen UK-US cooperation um, and to allow the UK the freedom to play a more proactive role in that space. My concern would be that it removes a very pro-NATO pro-US, pro-Atlanticist voice from the European debate. And we know that not all European countries who are members of NATO are as committed to NATO as the UK is. And therefore, if you're taking a pro-NATO voice out, what is left is not by necessity more sceptical. I'm not saying that it's anti-NATO, but it does remove a voice that is supportive. And I think that is one of the challenges that we will need to see addressed within NATO as an organisation post-Brexit. I also um, would slightly sort of want to revisit the idea that a European common defence force um, is complementary to NATO. I don't think that it is. And I don't think it is uh, primarily because it, it allows uh, an excuse almost for NATO to walk away from things that it would have done in the past. Because if, if there is a European force that can be expected to step up on an issue that falls more clearly within European interest, then if they don't act, it's a bit too easy for NATO to say, well, or the United States leadership of NATO to say, well, it's their responsibility. They now have sufficient structure and organization and they should do it. And it is not always the case that Europe is able to pull together cohesively to decide on foreign policy interventions and to do what um, otherwise might be uh, tasks that might be fulfilled by NATO. And I think about Kosovo and the general um, who uh, spoke, I thought, very eloquently about uh, some of his views on, on this. Uh, but on Kosovo, the example used was that NATO did the military and European Union did the economic uh, regeneration type work, the reconstruction. Well, that's fine. That's very different to a European Union defence force that takes up a military role. It's more of an economic role and it is complementary. Uh, if we were to see today, uh, or if we'd see in the future, a strong Euro European army, defence force and a, and a strong NATO and something happened in somewhere like Kosovo, it would be a bit too easy for the United States, for example, to say that is not NATO's uh, direct concern. That is now a matter for the European Union. And we know the European Union would struggle potentially to agree on how it would act and has a track record generally of being less willing to support military intervention when compared to the NATO alliance. And we should remember, of course, one of the reasons that the United States was persuaded, President Clinton was persuaded to go into Kosovo was the relatively recent legacy four years earlier of what had happened in Rwanda and not wanting to see uh, anything like that on his watch. And that was a failure not of the European Union, but of uh, other in, uh, state intervention in that case, France, to stop something terrible from happening, which then led the United States to say, we must step up and be part of the intervention in Kosovo. Uh, well, I think if there was a strong European defence force, there would be one more argument, maybe not definitive, but one more argument for the United States to say, you guys deal with that, uh, we don't need to, NATO shouldn't. And I, I think that would be a worrying uh, shift. On the, the issue of, of border force, I think there's potential for support. Clearly, NATO has a very broad range of resources that could be deployed uh, for patrols, for monitoring, but we have to, at the same time, be careful because a military alliance 
is to secure our borders in a slightly different way uh, to when we're looking at either smuggling or refugees. Uh, and I think it would cause tensions within NATO were it to go too far down the track of taking on the sort of border force type role. There's a contribution to be made, but we should recognize that uh, NATO as an alliance is for certain things and types of things. And there is nothing wrong with cooperation outside of that structure that is not in conflict with it. That isn't to say that we should try to expand its role endlessly to do all of the things that we might struggle with domestically or within the European Union or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, perhaps actually you could just f finish off on that thread of the, of the EU Defence Force and, and turn back to the general, because I'm getting a number of questions in here uh, online. And one of them is from <clears throat> Fatmi Medju, who's the former Defence Minister of Albania. Um, and he wants to push a little bit deeper. You know, is there any area <clears throat> where a separate EU alliance can provide more efficiencies in, ch in, uh, in the challenges that we face? Um, and could the EU muster sufficient defence capacity and spending from its member states were there to be any, uh, any new conflicts? General, are you muted? I, I, I get blues like the, the communicate. Will you mind to repeat the, the, again the question? Because okay, I um, so we had a number of comments. One of them is from Fatima Medju, who's the former Defence Minister of Albania. Hmm. And he would like to know to what extent could a European alliance uh, replace the role of NATO in Europe? And is, are there any situations where, you know, having this second alliance could provide some efficiencies and some, you know, uh, 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 more efficiencies in terms of deliverance of the service? Um, and could the EU muster sufficient defence capacity and spending from its member states were there to be a, a, a new conflict? No, I, I don't see any, any, uh, any occasion that, that, that uh, a, Euro a future uh, European for a future is, first of all, we need to establish all the force and all the structure. I cannot see in the near future just a European force just to replace NATO. NATO has a strong strength, like an integrated command structure, like a very big force generation project, and a standard uh, interoperatively, and a political and military um, decision making structure. And this is important. And this is not easy to get for European Union. In my view, behind the European Union for is more a technological business matter than really an operational matter. You know, this has been a lot of money for the European agency for 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 uh, developing technology military technologies. You know that that is my view. I cannot see uh, in the next future that an uh, European force replace all the strength that NATO already already have put in place. Excellent. Uh, let me turn back to Niall now, um, and slightly different question, but. Should NATO be looking to expand its membership, um, particularly with regards to Ukraine, Georgia and Bosnia? Um, well, firstly, I mean, I think it's important that NATO maintains its open door uh, policy. Uh, and, uh, you know, NATO has always been an aspirational alliance. It's always been a, a beacon of uh, freedom and, and hope. Uh, and we have to maintain that. And we also have to send the message to the Russians that they don't call the shots when it comes to uh, who NATO admits as, as a new member. And, and I think that, um, you know, in the case of uh, Georgia, Ukraine, for example, we should in the long, the long term hold out the possibility of membership of the alliance. Um, and that, that, is, that is extremely important, I think. And, and NATO is... It's more than, you know, I think that 
its importance just not does not rest solely upon its um <clears throat> its NATO its military role. NATO is also, uh, I think, a uh, hugely inspiring alliance as well. And so to give to give that kind of hope to those who presently have part of their territory under Russian control, under the boot of Moscow, to give them the hope that one day they could possibly be members of the NATO alliance. That, that's a very important message to, to send. So I'm a big believer in an open door policy for NATO. Uh, I'm a strong believer in the idea that NATO must, must constantly expand its, its, uh, its borders further, further afield. If the Russians don't like it, well, that's, that's tough. You know, and, uh, you know, we decide who, who joins the NATO alliance, the Russians do not. Uh, and, uh, and I think that it is vital that we, uh, we continue to, uh, to hold out that, that possibility of, of further uh, expanding the, the alliance. And just add one thing, actually, uh, in response to comments earlier about the EU defence identity. Uh, and I, I think, you know, some, some excellent remarks have made earlier. I, I would just add that, uh, you know, the idea of a European Union army uh, is really, it, it's, a, it's a political vanity project more than anything else. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's the dream of, of Eurofederalists such as Macron and Jean-Paul Juncker, etc. Uh, in, in practice, I, I think that, you know, the idea that some sort of European Union military could replace the United States is just is just pure dreamland for for the Euro Federalists, and which is exactly why uh, Vladimir Putin uh, called uh, you know Macron's uh, uh, remarks in favour of a European Union army as as a positive development. To quote Vladimir Putin, uh, and it is significant as well that you know President Trump started off certainly as a NATO skeptic. And at the start of his presidency, he made remarks that that worried many NATO partners. But today, uh, there is no stronger supporter of NATO than than President Trump. And that, that that's very very significant. And it's now the French president is talking about NATO being on its on its deathbed. Um, and and so um, you know, with regard to the present U.S. president, he's one hundred percent committed to. To NATO, he's committed to fully to uh, NATO's Article Five and to the principle of collective defence, and he's committed as well to NATO expansion. And so that's all uh, calls for, um, uh, for optimism. And and I hope that whoever is in place in the White House in uh, in 2021, and I'm sure whoever is in place will definitely continue these uh, these policies. Very yeah, excellent. So, Guli, do you, I mean, do you want to have a crack at that as well in terms of, uh, you know, what, what likelihood are there, do you think, of uh, these Eastern Partnership countries joining NATO in the near future? Uh, and, uh, you know, what, 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 what's been going on in that field? Well, I agree uh, that we should uh, keep uh, the open door policy, but of course we need to be uh, true to ourselves. And when we are open up for others are saying that they do have a possibility of joining NATO, then it must be something that needs to be ful fulfilled at, uh, at some point. Uh, I think it's uh, mostly to do with the credibility of, of the alliance, uh, that it's ready to uh, take on responsibility. Uh, but uh, it's hard though to uh, predict what will happen in the near future. I, I'm sure that if we have had met in, in January and someone had predicted what happened uh, these last few months, I think that uh, no one would have believed that person. But a uh, lot of things can also happen which we, we do not uh, see, uh, we do not know how how going to develop. One thing that is very seldom discussed, and that is uh, post-Putin post Russia. Uh, I haven't got a clue what will happen uh, when uh, Putin uh, calls it a day, because it seems to me that he would be at least this moment, he, will, he is the one who will de decide. And we are seeing uh, Russia, uh, which is, a, of course, a, a huge military power, not that economically uh, strong. And uh, we could see a, a, all kinds of disturbances if uh, things will not go in the, in the right direction. Uh, but uh, to answer the question, should we have an open door policy? Yes. Should we uh, let those... Uh, uh, friends of ours uh, join NATO, uh, definitely, and I think it's a very positive sign that we're giving the uh, 
science as we are cooperating and we we are not uh, we, we are not uh, we are not left them and uh, our presence and the cooperation is something that is really valuable to them but uh, the only way to uh, go forward the only way to uh, protect ourselves to pro protect our values is with strong nato and uh, and i it's a rather strange and a bit annoying that uh, this obvious fact is not, uh, well, you sometimes get the feeling it's not known to uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, at the moment, even though we can be optimistic about a lot of things, and when it comes to the security situation in the world, there's a lot of challenges to say the least, and we have mentioned few. Thank you, thank you. Now, we've got, we've got five minutes late, uh, left, so... Um, if I could sort of turn to sort of closing remarks now, perhaps James, would you like to kick us off, you know, with just a final kind of how should NATO adapt in the coming years? Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to take part in what's been a very interesting discussion. Um, NATO has served us very well for 70 years. It has been the main um, force for peace in the Western world and protected its members with extraordinary success. But in the future, I think it faces real challenges. I think that uh, its lead member, undoubtedly the United States, will be pulled towards the East and its other global interests, not exclusively, but it will be part of its consideration. Uh, the nature of warfare continues to evolve and change in a way that its structures will need to work hard and flexibly in order to adapt to. Uh, and it is incumbent on all those of us in politics to support NATO by advocating for uh, the 2% at least in defence spending, by being cautious uh, and wary of structures or proposals that might undermine uh, the basis of the alliance and the great work that it has done uh, in the past, uh, and by it being evangelists for it in, in pointing out its importance to those who perhaps do not appreciate uh, fully why it is there. And I think complacency may be the greatest danger to NATO. We have now more than a generation of people who cannot envisage war in their homes, on their doorsteps, war in Europe, it is a, a black and white history photograph or video or documentary to them now. Uh, people must understand that it can sadly come back and return all too quickly. It is NATO that prevents that. And those of us engaged in politics, whatever our individual views on Europe um, or on other matters political, if we support NATO, have a duty, I feel, to make the case for it uh, afresh and anew at every opportunity we get. Thank you. Niall, can I give you just uh, one minute to, uh, to close off? Actually, yeah. 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 I'm muted now. Uh, firstly, thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, to join this uh, distinguished panel today. It's been a great discussion. Uh, and I would just uh, conclude by, by saying that NATO is really the, the beating heart of the, the transatlantic alliance. And the transatlantic alliance is the beating heart of the free world. If we allow NATO to decline uh, or become marginalized or irrelevant or divided, um, that would have a fundamentally damaging impact on the broader transatlantic alliance, and it would gravely weaken the, the defense of the free world in the face of a whole array of, of adversaries. And we face more adversaries today, frankly, than, you know, than we did three or four decades ago. And we are living in very dangerous times. Uh, and NATO is so fundamentally important to guaranteeing that that broader security. And we must do all we possibly can to preserve the NATO alliance, to strengthen the NATO alliance, and to ensure that this is not a, a two-tier alliance, but it's, it's an alliance where all member states are pitching in, stepping up to the plate, investing in the common collective defense and security. Uh, and I, I, it's certainly my view that the NATO alliance will be with us for many, many more decades to come as a strong and powerful force for good in the world today. Thank you, Niall, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, can I turn to the General, just a, a, a one minute? Uh, just, just, just one minute as conclusion. I think NATO, re, re, NATO remain valuable for both US and Europe, and the member states will continue to invest in the alliance. If NATO wants to be relevant in the, in the next future, will rely on its ability to react to growing 
tension, as, as Barton Sarin had been said, to adapt to a multipolar world and also to modernize to combat the new threats. Thank you, thank, thank you General. Guli, final word? There's not much to add. Uh, I think that is very important and uh, we should bear in mind that the transatlantic cooperation is vital. It's not important, it's vital. And if uh, the ties be between, the, uh, if the transatlantic ties are neglected in some way, then we have some big problems, especially when it comes to the security and defense. So my message is very clear. NATO has always been extremely important and nothing ha can, uh, uh, and, and uh, nothing is uh, can come in, in, in place of, of NATO, but now and in the near and distant future, the importance of NATO is is extremely great, and we should uh, do everything to uh, to stick with NATO. So I thank you for uh, this good panel. It's important to dis th discuss things because if we do, we we tend to take things for granted. And uh, then when we take things, good things for granted, uh, then we are in danger of losing it. Well, th thank you, Gurley. Thank you to everyone. We, we've, we've come to our hour, and thank you for a very lively and fruitful discussion. There's so much to this. We need, uh, we need more time, but sadly we can't now. So I will bring it to a close by just saying a huge thank you from all of us at uh, ECR Party uh, for participating on this panel. Um, and thank you so much. Um, for those that have been listening, uh, the discussion is recorded on our website, should you view, wish to view any of the comments, uh, at uh, www.ecrparty.eu. Um, you'll also find it on YouTube, um, Twitter, and uh, Facebook. Um, do join us again next week on Thursday, the 21st of May, at the earlier time of 2 o'clock Central Euro European time, for the next webinar, which is titled The European Green Deal. Details can be found on the website, uh, as well as the other social media channels. So I'd just like to thank all of you for, for, for uh, coming onto the panel, for everybody who's been watching, and I wish you a very pleasant afternoon. Stay safe, and I hope to see you here again next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.